Picture the setting. It's 2003 and the war in Iraq is about to commence. An operation is being planned and you are the general in command. A risk assessment meeting is taking place and you must decide how to proceed. You're given the stats. In particular, you're told how many bug splats there are per attack. A bug splat, I might add, is a civilian death. Because from the eye of a drone, a civilian dying looks like a bug being squashed. A heavy bug splat is over 30 civilian deaths per strike. General, everything is ready. But we predict 22 heavy bug splats. What do we do? How would you answer? Well, the general in command, General Tommy Franks of the US Army, he replied. And he said, go ahead with all 22. And you might be thinking a number of things at this point. You might be thinking, this is so cruel. These were innocent people. Or you might be thinking, this is the reality of war. This is collateral damage. When I heard this, I didn't think either of these things. Because when I heard this, I could not get past one single question. How can the official government program be called Booksplat? How can we be so desensitized in our terminology? How did we get here? To answer that question properly, allow me to take a few steps back. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Salah Sharif. I'm an academic director of wordsmiths. I was born and raised in Manchester of Iraqi Kurdish descent. But I'm here today because I read an article five years ago. That article was about Stephen Green, a US Army soldier who raped and killed 14-year-old Abir al Janabi. Not only did he rape and kill her, he burnt her body and then proceeded to kill and burn her siblings and her parents. The crime was so horrific that when sentencing, the judge, he didn't ask why. He asked how. How could you bring it upon yourself to do this to another human being? And that's when Stephen Green replied, and he said, I couldn't do this to another human being. But Iraqis are not human. And only then did I truly understand the word dehumanization. And so I kept researching further and further. Four years and one PhD later, here we are today. I dedicate my PhD to Abir, and I dedicate this TED talk to her too. May she rest in peace. But the question remains, what exactly is dehumanization? Dehumanization is the act of removing the human element from a person. To negate their identity as a human being. And the most apparent form of dehumanization is called animalistic dehumanization. This is where we degrade someone to the level of an animal or lower. Such as in the Holocaust, when the, when the Jews were referred to as vermin. Or the Rwandan genocide, when the Tutsis were referred to as inyenzi, cockroach. And the reason why we dehumanize is because as human beings, we're naturally averse to conflict and torture and killing. That's why we develop things like PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. It's a byproduct of the trauma that we face. It's a, it's a coping mechanism of sorts. In World War II, it was recorded that only 15 to 25 percent of soldiers who had the opportunity to shoot at the enemy ever took their shot. Imagine, the fact that 75% of soldiers refuse to shoot in battle just demonstrates humanity's resistance to killing. And so dehumanization is used as a tool to allow us to commit these acts. It was said that even Eichmann, Adolf Eichmann, one of the highest ranking Nazi officials, was sickened when he toured the concentration camps that he organized himself. But to participate in mass murder, all he had to do was shuffle papers at a desk. 
And so there is another type of dehumanization called mechanistic dehumanization. This is where we act so mechanically that we become indifferent to the other person's existence. The issue here is not that we consider them as less than human. The issue is that we do not consider them at all. Richard Evans once said that the road to Auschwitz was built by hate but paved by indifference. So many of the genocides, of the murders, of the killings throughout human history were committed by people who would ordinarily consider themselves to be good. So the question arises, how can people who would consider themselves to be good and moral under the circumstances commit such horrific acts? In 1961, Stanley Milgram, a Yale psychologist, sought to find the answer. Following the trials of Adolf Eichmann, Stanley Milgram made an experiment. He gathered a group of subjects to pose questions to a student. And at the order of a scientist in a lab coat, the subject would administer electric shocks to the student every time they got an answer wrong. The scientist and the student were both acting, but the subject didn't know. Milgram was researching obedience to authority. It starts with 15 volts, minor discomfort, and it ends on 450 excruciating volts. However, he also found that the further away the subject was to this victim, the more likely they were to participate. There were four iterations of the same experiment. In the first iteration, the subject was in a different room. They couldn't hear nor see. The moans of the, and, and the groans and the complaints of the victim was transcribed on a computer screen. Ouch. Please stop. He found that 65% of subjects continued until the very end. In the second version, voice proximity was introduced. The victim was, had a microphone connected, and so the, the subject could hear everything. Please stop! I've had enough, please! I don't want to continue anymore! Ouch! 62.5% of people continued until the very end. However, in the third iteration, visual proximity was introduced. They were in the same room. Every groan, every grimace can be seen. And only 40% of people continued until the very end. And in the fourth and final iteration, touch proximity was introduced. When the victim would refuse to continue, the expert would command or request the subject to place their hand on the victims in order to administer the electric shock and 30% of people continued until the very end. And so as you can see behind me, the closer the subject was to the victim, the less likely they were to participate. And so I ask you, would you shock someone? Would you participate in, and let's not beat around the bush, torture? And while you're thinking about that, consider that Milgram's subjects were ordinary individuals like you and I. Throughout human history, technology has been used in war to distance ourselves from our enemies. From killing someone with your bare hands, to shooting them, to a sniper, to a bomb, we're taking steps further and further away. Because the further we are from our enemies, the easier it is to kill them, because the harder it is to empathize. William Manchester was a US soldier, turned author, and he recalls, I shot him with a 45, and I felt remorse and shame. I can remember whispering foolishly, I'm sorry, and then throwing up. I threw up all over myself, and it was a betrayal of what I'd been taught as a child. These are the scenes of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Now let's compare this to a scene further away. An RAF crew member describes the scenes 20,000 feet above the air, only moments after he firebombed an entire city. He said, I saw no streets, no outlines of buildings, only bright fires which flared like yellow torches against a background of bright red ash. 
Above the city was a misty red haze. I looked down, fascinated, yet aghast. Satisfied, yet horrified. The crew were close enough to imagine the consequence of their actions, but they weren't close enough to view each individual death. They were close enough to be horrified, yet far enough to be satisfied. As you can see behind me, there is a direct correlation between physical distance and resistance to killing. From hand-to-hand -hand combat to, a, to shooting someone with a gun to a sniper to a bomb, there is a dramatic decline in resistance to killing. Drones can be placed furthest to the right on your x-axis. Because if you can see someone thousands of miles away on a camera screen, are you close to them or are you far? You might have access to them, but there is no joint presence. They can't see you, nor can they hear you. They don't even know that you exist. And so we've entered an unprecedented time in human history where an entire war can be carried out without any human interaction whatsoever. Lieutenant Colonel David Brenham from the US Air Force, he says that in our lifetime, we can enter and complete a war without ever leaving the United States, or of course, the United Kingdom. Milgram's experiments prove it's easier to harm someone when they cannot see what you're doing because it allows us to hide the shame and guilt. When killing in the vicinity of your enemy, you see their blood, you hear their screams, and you remember your foe's last utterance. This intense connection makes it so much more difficult to kill. In fact, it becomes an obstacle. But perhaps, Perhaps the obstacle is a necessary one. A man sipping tea in Florida can press a button and a village in Yemen can cease to exist. It's well known in these conflict areas that if you can hear a drone, then it's not meant for you. Because if it was meant for you, you wouldn't have time to hear it. The boundaries of war are becoming diminished, and as a result, we're blurring the lines between war and peace. And these instantaneous attacks not only bypass international law, they bypass our natural inhibition towards or against conflict. And this is arguably far worse. And so I want us here today to consider the detachment and dehumanization in our own lives. Remember that the road to Auschwitz was built by hate, but paved by indifference. Remember that dehumanization, even in genocides, does not happen overnight. It's a gradual effect. And in an age of rapidly developing technology, automation, depersonalization, we need to take active measures to safeguard our own humanity. Our drone operator was asked, how it feels to kill someone through a computer screen. He said, it's like a video game. You can get a little bloodthirsty, but it's fucking cool. Remember that Abir al Janabi wasn't dehumanized overnight. But Stephen Green's very gradual detachment and desensitization led to an innocent young 14-year-old child lose her life and her family in the most horrific way. Abir paid the ultimate price. And so our goal is to feel the pain and suffering of those across the world as if they're in our own backyard. But we don't need to go that far sometimes. The next time you ask a friend, how are you? And they reply, yeah, I'm fine. Say, no, really, how are you? Because if you needed anything ever, remember, I'm always here. Thank you for listening.